Hello and good afternoon. Thank you once again for tuning in. Today I would like to talk about the Mount Pinatubo volcanic eruption which happened in the Philippines in June of 1991. And I will get into explaining it, but the reason I'm covering this volcano is because I think the event is pretty important and it's very telling and I think I think that the Mount Pinatubo volcanic explosion is probably the closest thing that we have witnessed and recorded that might compare to a historical mud flood which we can see evidence of having happened 170 to 200 years ago. One of the most important things I think that is associated with the volcanic explosion of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines is the lahars that it caused. Lahars, that's a new word for me as well and that that term basically means mud flow. And during and after the Mount Pinatubo explosion it caused a lot of lahars, which maybe, if you've never heard the term, is similar to a mudslide, a landslide. And if you look at Rebel Without a Pause's channel, you know, he's recently pointed out some videos that are available on YouTube where you can see these lahars or these mud flow examples. So that is why I'm covering. Mount Pinatubo. Now I'm trying to make a more serious video here and I will reserve my personal opinions and comments till the end and I'll leave that to the comment section. I might add some of my own opinions there. But really what I'd like to do is just cover the Mount Pinatubo event and the evidence and just the facts. And I'd like to get right into it. Now if I wanted to go looking for evidence of mud flood in the Philippines. There are some really great examples in one of the popular historic and tourist areas in Manila and that is Intramuros. And in Intramuros there's a fort called Fort Santiago and you can actually go on Google Maps and kind of do a street view walk around of this place. So I'm just going to show a few images on the screen of Fort Santiago in Intramuros. I think this is actually a star fort for one which is very interesting to anybody who's looking into mud flood and history and Tartaria and all this other stuff. And another place to be looking at is another great mysterious place to look at in the Philippines as far as mud flood goes is the Nog Carlon Underground Cemetery and I will try and leave a description of that in the link below and that's in Laguna in the Philippines and actually this is a good example of underground tunnels of course they're being used as a crypt well I won't go off on tangents about that but Philippines certainly has good examples of mud flood but today I'm going to talk about the eruption of Mount Pinatubo okay before I begin I'd like to drop a few definitions of words that are related to the study of volcanoes and lahars and mud flood because I think if I'm going to do a proper job and do my duty and responsibility in studying mud flood, I should probably at least adopt some of these terms and phrases. Because, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Science has already come up with definitions for these things. So I'm going to try and start using them. That's a personal choice. I'm not saying other people have to do that. Okay, so just going to try to cover this as quick as I can. Definitions. A pyroclastic surge, a pyroclastic surge is a fluidized mass of turbulent gas and rock fragments that is ejected during some volcanic eruptions. It is similar to a pyroclastic flow, but it has a lower density or contains a much higher ratio of gas to rock, which makes it more turbulent and allows it to rise over ridges and hills rather than always travel downhill as pyroclastic flow does. 
Saint Pierre in Martinique in 1902 was overcome by a pyroclastic surge. But the definition that I just provided here is a little bit ambiguous as to whether pyroclast is rock or gas. It's probably somewhere in between. Okay, next definition a lahar. A lahar, lahar is a violent type of mud flow or debris flow composed of slurry or pyroclast material, rocky debris and water. The material flows down from a volcano typically along a river valley. Lahars are extremely destructive. They can flow about 22 miles per hour or more. They have been known to be up to 460 feet deep and large flows tend to destroy any structures in their path. They have been known to decimate entire settlements. Notable lahars include those at Mount Pinatubo and Nevado del Ruiz, which I think is in Colombia. Don't quote me. That deserves to be investigated too. Nevado del Ruiz killed thousands of people and caused extensive damage to infrastructure. Lahar is just a synonym, a synonym, a word that means the same thing. Lahar, mud flow, mud flood, lahar. It's the same word. Okay, next definition, tephra. Tephra is fragmental material produced by a volcanic eruption regardless of composition, fragment size, or emplacement mechanism. Volcanologists also refer to airborne fragments as pyroclasts. Once clasts have fallen to the ground, they remain as tephra, unless hot enough to fuse together into pyroclastic rock or turf. And this is just my opinion, but from what I gather, tephra seems to be a catch-all word for stuff that comes out of a volcano. Tephra. Next term, dacite. Dacite. I've heard it pronounced both ways in looking up videos on YouTube. Dacite is an igneous volcanic rock. It has a fine grain to crystalline texture. The word dacite comes from Dacia, where the rock was first described. And it seems to be that uh, historically Romania and Moldova had first description of this igneous rock called dacite. But having looked it up on YouTube, it seems like it's all over the world. North America, everywhere. Next definition, you're probably familiar with this term, magma. Magma. Magma is a mixture of molten or semi-molten rock, volatiles and solids that is found beneath the surface of the earth. Besides molten rock, magma may also contain suspended crystals, dissolved gas, and sometimes gas bubbles. Magma often collects in magma chambers that may feed a volcano or solidify underground to form an intrusion. Magma is capable of intruding into adjacent rocks forming igneous dikes and sills extrusion onto the surface as lava and explosive ejection as tephra or fragmented rock to form pyroclastic rock. So there's a little bit of overlap between terms like tephra, dacite, what was the other one I said? Pyroclastic surge. It's all used to describe the stuff coming out of a volcano. Okay, so kind of a shame that took 10 minutes and I haven't even talked about my subject yet. Mount Pinatubo and I'm just going to read. I basically took the Wikipedia article, which ended up being 20 pages of text on the Word program, and I managed to condense it down into six pages. So I just made a script, and I'm going to read it. The June 15th, 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines is the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. The eruption produced high-speed avalanches of hot ash and gas, massive lahar floods, and huge clouds of superheated volcanic material hundreds of kilometers across. Abundant lightning was generated during the blast. Heavy rains from Typhoon Yunya was happening at the same time. Ash was ejected to 34 kilometers high by the most violent phase of the eruption, which lasted about three hours. There were 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide emission. The final massive eruption of Mount Pinatubo began at 13.42, so almost, almost 2 o'clock in the afternoon, on June 15, 1991. It caused numerous major earthquakes due to the collapse of the summit, 
and the creation of a caldera, which is like a bowl-shaped crater, which was two and a half kilometers in diameter, reducing the peak from 5,700 feet to 4,800 feet. So the height before and after the eruption of the volcano was reduced by a thousand feet. The top conical peak of the mountain basically was turned into a crater and reduced by a thousand feet. So that's a huge height that was reduced. Pyroclastic surges blasted out of the summit, reaching as far as 16 kilometers away. The volcanic blast covered an area of some 125,000 square kilometers. It brought total darkness to much of central Luzon. Luzon being the main island in the Philippine Islands, and Manila is on Luzon. It's the main island. So the volcanic blast covered an area of 125,000 square kilometers, and it brought total darkness to much of central Luzon. Almost all of the island's central east section received some muddy ash fall, which formed a heavy rain saturated snow-like blanket. So it's basically raining volcanic debris. Vast quantities of minerals and metals were brought to the surface. Many hundreds of thousands of tons of zinc, copper, chromium, nickel, lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury were brought to the surface. It reported 847 people were killed by the eruption. Tens of thousands of people were spared due to the prior evacuations of the area. Mount Pinatubo is located in the Zambales Mountains between Zambales, Tarlac, and Pampanga. Its eruptive history was known to most before the pre-eruption volcano activities of 1991. Okay, so its eruptive history was unknown. And that's a, that's a point to stress, that this really wasn't a, an active volcano and people really didn't know about it until the actual eruption happened. It might have been popular in the area. There was a historical president of the Philippines, Ramon Magsaysay, in like the 50s, I think, who actually had an airplane named after him called Mount Pinatubo because that president was actually from this area. But anyway, people outside of this area probably didn't know too much about Pinatubo. Pinatubo was a heavily eroded, inconspicuous, and ob obscured from view. It was covered with dense forest, which supported a population of several thousand indigenous Aita. And those people are a little bit unique and distinct from uh, other Filipinos that you might be familiar with seeing. And I won't go into discussing that, but there is an indigenous group of people that tend to be surrounding this area of Pinatubo. And I might as well mention it now, as far as the most affected people during this uh, Mount Pinatubo explosion, well, it was the Aita people, because they practically become refugees in their own country, and they end up having to flee their homes. And they're even affected long term, like they're completely displaced. Mount Pinatubo was the second largest terrestrial eruption of the 20th century, after the 1912 eruption of Novarupta in Alaska. Pinatubo brought a lethal mix of ash and rain to towns and cities surrounding the volcano. Surrounding areas were severely damaged by pyroclastic surges, ash falls, and subsequently by the flooding lahars caused by rainwater remobilizing earlier volcanic deposits. Basically mud flood. This caused extensive destruction to infrastructure and changed river systems for years after the eruption. <coughs> okay, the effects of the eruption were felt worldwide. It ejected roughly 10 cubic kilometers of magma and 20 billion tons of sulfur dioxide, bringing vast quantities of minerals and toxic metals to the surface. It injected more particulate into the stratosphere. That's a debatable term these days, but it injected more particulate into the stratosphere than any eruption since Krakatoa in 1883. Over the following months, the aerosols formed an earth-wide layer of sulfuric acid and haze. Okay, overview of the area. The volcano is 87 kilometers northwest of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Near Mount Pinatubo, the United States maintained two large military bases in the region. The first was the U.S. naval base at Subic Bay, which was 37 kilometers distant from Mount Pinatubo, and Clark Air Base, which was closer. It was 14 kilometers away from Mount Pinatubo. Uh, just generally, 
Wikipedia said that the volcano is near to about 6 million people. History. Before the 1991 eruption, Mount Pinatubo's summit was 5,725 feet above sea level. It was only 660 feet higher than surrounding peaks. The most recent study of Mount Pinatubo before the activities of 1991 was the overall geological study in 1983 and 1984 made by F. G. Delphine for the Philippine National Oil Company as part of the surface investigations of the area before exploratory drilling and well testing for geothermal energy sources in 1988 to 1990. And I'm not going to go into conspiracy theories or speculation on it, but here you do have oil drilling for, I guess, geothermal energy. And actually, I think I'll read later in my script that this drilling activity stopped, like, of April, April 1991. So this is actually just before the volcanic explosions. You had cessation of drilling activity and exploration in this area. I'll leave that for people watching to speculate on. A Soma volcano which I guess is what Mount Pinatubo is, is a volcano caldera that has been partially filled by a new central cone. The old volcano is exposed in the walls of an old 3.5 km by 4.5 km wide caldera referred to as Taiwan Caldera by Delphine. That's the author. And some of the nearby peaks are the remnants of ancestral Pinatubo left behind when the softer parts of the old mountain slopes were eroded by weathering. Basically there's like this massive caldera ancient crater and Pinatubo is kind of within side of it. And Pinatubo is like the new cone inside an old crater. That's what I gather. Possible precursor in 1990. I reduced the writing of this down, I tried to condense it, but there was an earthquake that happened in Luzon in 1990, and it was a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake that struck northern Luzon, or northern central Luzon. This was the largest earthquake recorded in 1990, comparable in size to the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and the 2008 Sichuan earthquake, which I guess is China. Um, if you've been following mud flood and historical disasters that don't quite seem right, well the 1906 San Francisco earthquake probably is something you are already familiar with, but I won't go off on a tangent about that. The epicenter of this 1990 earthquake which happened in the Philippines was in the municipality of Rizal, Nueva Ecija, about 100 kilometers northeast of Pinatubo. So basically there's academics and scientific people who are pointing to a previous earthquake that happened, a pretty severe one, and of course they speculate as that may be being the cause of Mount Pinatubo. If you ask me, I have no clue what the cause of Mount Pinatubo is and I, I can't even speculate. The whole point of making this video is basically because I think lahars, first of all because lahars are associated with this Mount Pinatubo eruption, which is mud flood. So that is why I'm covering it. Okay, I made a chart. The Wikipedia article went through the very specific details of the sequence of events for the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. I took it and I condensed it into a chart. And as you're watching this, you might want to pause the screen and read this through yourself. I think I got it pretty close. And of course, I'm going to put nice pictures to this. So this chart that I made might go off the screen. Okay. So, 1991 activities leading to the eruption. This is a timeline. So, on March 15th of 1991, a succession of earthquakes felt by locals happened on the northwest side of the volcano. At the end of March 1991, earthquakes were increasing with intensity. April 2, 1991, stream eruption without lava ejection along a fissure. So, I guess there's a big long crack in the ground, a fissure. I don't know if that's Pinatubo itself, but there's this fissure and magma, lava is not coming out, but we've got steam, steam coming out. Mid-April 1991, small eruptions continued dusting the surrounding area with volcanic ash, and there's seismographic records of this. May 1991, volcanic activity increased. There was like sulfur dioxide emissions were rapidly increasing, and these sulfur dioxide emissions were also implying that there was magma beneath the volcano. Something was getting hot. May 28th, 1991, we're getting much closer to the main event. Sulfur dioxide emissions decreased, and when there was a decrease in these sulfur dioxide emissions, people started to think, at least uh, the USGS and the military people that were there, that there might be a plug, a plug in the volcano, and so that pressure was building. June 3rd, 1991, first magmatic eruptions occurred. So now we have magma 
coming out of Mount Pinatubo. June 7, 1991, first large blast generated ash, 7 kilometers high, so we actually have the first volcanic blast on June the 7th, and there was like this lava dome that was building up on the summit. I've just read about this at this point, I haven't found pictures of it, so it's a little bit hazy even to me. Okay, the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismography issued a warning on June the 7th and they started evacuating people in the nearby region, I think within 10 kilometers, and apparently evacuated 5,000 people. June 12th, 1991, there was a small blast at 341, so this is in the morning, marked by the beginning of a new, more violent phase of eruptions. A couple hours later, massive blasts lasting about a half an hour, and this generated big eruption columns. When they say columns in these articles, they're talking about the pyroclast, which is blowing out of the top of Mount Pinatubo, the column, because it goes straight up, shoots up into the air. That's what I gather, and this reached heights of 19 kilometers up in the air. Pyroclastic surges are filling up uh, local river valleys around the area. Then on June 13th, there was a 15-minute blast, which hurled volcanic matter to heights of 24 kilometers. And this really struck my attention, but uh, at these more severe blasts, pointing towards the sky, we have lightning. Lightning. When I looked at the New Madrid uh, event in some of my previous videos, I looked at telluric currents, or basically electrical current going through the earth. So here you have abundant lightning. Lightning is a whole different topic that probably stands to be investigated, because if you ask me, could lightning be basically arcing from the surface of the earth to the firmament, if you're a flat earther? And on June the 13th, there was a swarm of small earthquakes. So we also have earthquakes happening. June the 14th, a three-minute eruptive blast generated a 21-kilometer-high eruption column, blast up into the air. June 15th, like this is the most extreme event, this is the definitive most explosive moment of Mount Pinatubo. Tephra fall from large eruptions, and this was extensive to the southwest side of the volcano. Two hours after these, a series of four explosions began, then there was like a continuous blast for 24 hours, and much larger pyroclastic flow and surges traveled several kilometers downriver and into valleys and on the flanks of the volcano. Dacite, which was the igneous rock, was the dominant rock making up the tephra in these eruptions. Okay, I highlighted these in yellow. The final massive eruption of Mount Pinatubo began at 1342, so this is close to 2 o'clock in the afternoon on June 15th, 1991, and the creation of a caldera, which again is like a crater, a big bowl shape, 2.5 kilometers in diameter, reducing the peak by a thousand feet. Ash is ejected 34 kilometers into the air. Pyroclastic surges blasted out from the summit, reaching a distance away, not up into the air, but a distance away of 16 kilometers from the crater. And to add complication, we have typhoon rains. So Typhoon Yunya is happening at this time. So this volcanic eruption is mixing with rains and it's creating ash deposits and causing it to rain. And then we have more instances of massive lahars. This is mud flood. This is landslides, all this kind of stuff. The volcanic blast column covered an area of some 125,000 square kilometers and total darkness was brought to the area of central Luzon. Luzon again being the main island in the Philippines. Almost all of Luzon received some muddy ashfall which formed a heavy rain saturated snow like blanket. Tephra, which is like the effluent of the volcano, was recorded as far away as Vietnam, Cambodia, Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. So this is going across the South China Sea. And the last detail, volcanologists believed 2230, so this is later at night, marked the end of the climactic eruptions. Evacuations. Philippi the Philippine Institute of Volcanology issues warnings, and they're kind of under pressure as to when and how to issue these warning evacuations. There's a sequence of events that's going on, so they're not sure how to time this and if the volcano is going to get worse. Three evacuation zones were defined. 10, 20, and 40 kilometers distance from the volcano, and both U.S. military bases within these zones were evacuated. There were five stages of volcano alert, 
and this was broadcast over local media, television, radio. Many of the Aitas, so these are the indigenous people of Mount Pinatubo, who lived on the slopes of the volcano, left their villages for good. They moved increasingly to distant settlements as the volcanoes erupted. The first formal evacuation was ordered on April 7th, that was in the very nearby vicinity, and further evacuations were made on June the 7th. A level 5 alert triggered evacuations in the outer regions, and people ended up becoming refugees, and they ended up going to Manila, and they ended up uh, seeking refuge in the Amaranto Velodrome in Quezon City, and this became an, an evacuee camp. I think it said this was filled up with like 30,000 people. So hopefully I'll get a, a picture of that on the screen. But like this major sports stadium, entertainment stadium, became a, an evacuation camp. The climactic eruption. All the seismographs close to Clark Air Base had been rendered completely inoperative at the time of the volcano. And I won't go into covering it, but there was a lot of uh, destruction of aircraft. And apparently there were 16 commercial aircraft flights, like in-flight aircraft, that was affected by the cloud ash and there was a lot of aircraft that was damaged on the ground. There were these uh, retired F-8 Philippine Air Force fighter jets and apparently they all got destroyed by the ash that fell on them. Explosivity of the eruption. Okay, so F Mount Pinatubo was the largest eruption since that of Novarupta in 1912 and some 10 times larger than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. 847 people were killed, mostly by roofs collapsing under the load of accumulated volcanic matter, volcanic ash, but okay, as far as the effects, this is this is things that I chose not to cover in my presentation. Many things, as you might expect, were disrupted and destroyed. So many forests, farmland, which included rice farmers, livestock farmers, poultry farmers, were destroyed. And this eliminated livelihoods, so people's jobs were gone, along with their homes. Roads and communications was affected by pyroclastic surges. Schools were destroyed and education was disrupted. And this was an interesting one. It came up in the Wikipedia article. And it's interesting for us who look into mud flood. But these Lahar floods kept happening well into 1992. So yeah, you had the volcanic eruptions stopping pretty much around June the 15th, 1991. But then you have these Lahars, these mud flood mud flow things that keep happening for the next half a year. In total, 364 communities and 2.1 million people were affected by the eruption, with livelihoods and houses being damaged and destroyed. More than 8,000 houses were completely destroyed, and a further 73,000 were damaged. Lahars. Before and after the eruption, a river valley filled in by pyroclastic flow deposits. Rivers are getting filled in. Since the eruption, each heavy rain has brought massive lahars from the volcano, displacing thousands of people and inflicting extensive damage to buildings and infrastructure, costing billions to repair. A large supply of funds were spent in constructing dikes and dams to control the post-eruption lahar flows. I've seen pictures of that. Uh, September 3rd, 1995, a lahar buried San Guillermo, Guillermo Parish to half of its height, 12 meters. So, okay, that means that this church, this parish, was 24 meters, and so you have like 12 meters, whatever that is in feet, you have 12 meters of mud flood inundation. The military impact, I don't know if I mentioned it already, but like um, Clark Air Force Base and Subic Bay Air Force Base, during this Operation Fiery Vigil, all these uh, U.S. military personnel were relocated to places in Japan, Hawaii, and Guam, maybe some other places. The ejection of aerosol, mainly sulfur dioxide, into the stratosphere is thought to have been the largest since Krakatoa in 1883. So the impact of the indigenous people of Pinatubo. Again, there's this indigenous group in the Philippines called Aita people, and they were the hardest hit. Their homes were destroyed, and even today they were displaced and they no longer live in this area. But these were the people who were most affected. In this crater, so the top of the volcano gets knocked off, and what's left is this massive crater. Well, over the years, and since 1991, it got filled in with rainwater, and so you basically have a lake in the top of the volcano. And maybe I can get a picture of this on the screen, but Lake Pinatubo has a very, very blue color, and it's full of, like, minerals. And it reminded me of Jasper 
Jasper National Park in Alberta because it's got a lake just like this. So hopefully I get a picture of that. Note to self to look into that later. Okay, this Lake Pinatubo ends up being very hot. It's like 40 degrees Celsius and it's very acidic with a pH of 2. And apparently since 2003 it's cooled down. And there were, others, there were some other stories about Lake Pinatubo that there was like a risk that the sidewalls of the volcanic crater would burst and maybe Lake Pinatubo would drain into the surrounding area and so there was actually a risk of flooding if this crater ever broke open so they actually made attempts from what I read to drain Lake Pinatubo a little bit. Okay the next thing I'm going to cover is the cultural history of Mount Pinatubo and to me this is the most fascinating topic and subject because I think that it touches upon pre-Diluvian type of folklore oral tradition which explains maybe things that go into prehistory which to me these days is looking a lot more like 170 to 200 years ago and uh, I might as well just read my script there is a local or oral tradition where an ancient legend tells of Bako Bako a terrible spirit of the sea who could metamorphose into a huge turtle and throw fire from its mouth. In the legend, when being chased by the spirit hunters, Bako Bako flees to the mountain and digs a great hole in the summit, showering the surrounding land with rock, mud, dust, fire, for three days, howling so loud that the earth shakes. That stands to be investigated by myself, but apparently there's an oral tradition and a cultural story that sounds very familiar to what happened in, in 1991. Other stories from other groups in the area, other stories have it that Pinatubo's peak shattered because of a deity's immense fury in an attempt to teach humans the meaning of fear and show how misdeeds will be punished. There's more to the story, I just condensed it. Even today, some of the native elders suggest the 1991 June eruption was because of godly displeasure towards illegal logging, the Philippine National Oil Company executives who performed deep exploratory drilling and well testing on the volcano looking for geothermal heat. Yep, uh, reference 46 on the Wikipedia article on Mount Pinatubo talks about how geothermal exploration uh, ceased in April of 1991. So this is just before the eruption happens. Oil and gas drilling prospecting kind of stops. There is a little bit of comment on the Wikipedia article about the etymology of the word Pinatubo. And this is very interesting to me. And please, if a, if a Filipino person is watching, if you wouldn't mind commenting. But apparently the word Pinatubo in Sambal language and even Tagalog language means fertile place where one can make crops grow or made to grow. That's the meaning of the word Pinatubo. Okay, final comments. I scripted this as well. I'm going off topic a little bit here. These are just some of my ideas. When teaching children about dinosaurs, there is a popular idea that gets presented to them. They are told that a cataclysmic event happened which made dinosaurs go extinct. I remember hearing these stories when I was growing up and today I have a lot of questions about the existence of dinosaurs but that's a different discussion. But I can't help thinking about how the Mount Pinatubo eruption where volcanic ash explodes into the sky causing, causing total darkness, I spilled my pens, and fills the air with ash caused many lahars or mud flow. I also think about the New Madrid earthquake, which is a topic I covered in a few previous videos, and during the sequence of events of the New Madrid earthquake, there were very eerily similar details, such as violent shocks, thunder, complete saturation of the atmosphere causing total darkness, bad smells, and sulfurous vapor. Well, Pinatubo had a lot of these same details involved with it. So in conclusion, I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to think that an event similar to the eruption of Mount Pinatubo could have happened in the past, resulting in many of the mud inundated buildings we see as evidence today. In my humble opinion, I think something like the eruption of Mount Pinatubo must have happened 170 to 200 years ago, but whatever happened, happened on a much larger scale. And maybe 
just maybe a previous civilization was wiped out. I'm thinking about Tartaria. Maybe it wasn't dinosaurs that went extinct. Maybe it was a civilization of people. And that's a scary idea, but I'm just telling you what I'm thinking. As to what caused the mud flood events 170 to 200 years ago, well, this still is a mystery and it stands to be investigated. But it is my humble opinion that a an event like the volcanic eruption of Mount Pinatubo is probably as good as an example as we can get as to the cause of raining ash and mud and lahars and mud flow and mud flood. Okay folks, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for being patient. I had to cover a lot of information, evidence. So thank you very much for watching and have a great day.